Amen. You guys can be seated. My guess is all of us know somebody, maybe an aunt, maybe it's just somebody in our family who's a really good chef, a really good cook, and they make a meal that you're like, that's an incredible meal. Like, I would do just about anything to be able to eat that meal. Maybe, maybe you know somebody who can make a really good pot of stew or maybe some type of soup or chili, and you're like, when that person makes that stew, when that person makes that, that bowl of, uh, of chili, it's incredible. You got, that picture? you got that picture in your mind, right? Let me ask you a question. Would you give up great riches? Would you give up a life of privilege? Would you give up honor? Would you give up, again, wealth and this living out God's best for you? Would you give that up if someone says, hey, you can have this incredible dish, this incredible bowl of stew, if you're willing to give that up. Would you do that? And immediately, all of us are like, Kenny, where are you, where are you going with this? Because nobody would do that. I want to give you a life-changing question for you to ask yourself. Would you give up God's best in your life for a momentary satisfaction? Would you give up God's best in your life for a moment of being able to have what you really are craving in that moment? And sure enough, if you were able to have it, you'd be like, man, that was incredible. The craving that I had in this moment is now over. This desire, would you, is there any momentary, maybe a half hour, maybe a day, maybe even a weekend of a desire? of a craving that you would give up in place of a lifetime, honor, privilege, wealth, riches. Would you be willing to do that? Somebody like, Kenny, where are you going with this? Man, that'd be, that'd be stupid to give up a lifetime of something for a momentary pleasure, for one instant, one moment of gratification. Hence the name of our message today, stupidity. Because people say, I'd be stupid to do it. So we're using the word stupidity and this idea of a bowl of stew. You'll see more, but it's momentary craving, lifetime impact, cravings. Let's talk a little bit about our internal cravings, those, those desires that are God-given. As a matter of fact, that's the first aspect. Internal grave, cravings are God-designed, but sin distorts them. God has designed it. So God's given us a very normal sense of, I'd like to feel accepted. I'd like to feel valued and loved. I like to have physical touch, many different desires, many things we will say these are an internal desire or craving that comes with baseline. This is how God has wired us up, and yet we will see this God design, but sin distorts it and says, you have that craving for acceptance. You have that craving, normal desire to be, uh, to be valued. But then there's different ways, sometimes sinful ways, sometimes unwise ways that we can have it fulfilled. Internal cravings also are never fully and finally satisfied. That bowl of stew, or maybe for you it's pizza, right? And you're so hungry. And you finally, man, I just want to eat. And as you're eating that stew, as you're consuming that wonderful homemade pizza just the way your grandma used to, that craving, it's satisfied. But the next day, you wake up and, man, I'd like to have another one. That's how cravings work. That's how desires work. They're never fully and finally satisfied. Internal cravings always whisper now and never later. When you have that rumbling in your tumbling in your stomach, you're like, I want it now. I don't want to wait till later. You're watching the, the, the football game, and you know there's some chips and quesadilla. Mmm, beautiful, wonderful in the kitchen. And you have that craving. You have that desire. And it's just now kickoff. That craving doesn't say, hey, let's just wait till the third quarter. You're like, man, get it now. I want to eat it now. Our desires... Our internal cravings, they never whisper to us, just, just wait a little longer. It's always now, never later. These internal cravings always come with a choice. 
Meaning there's a sense of you can choose to satisfy that immediate internal craving or you can put it off, you can wait. It always comes with a choice. All right, so you, you've got internal cravings. Kind of set the stage for this very unique Old Testament story that we're going to look at. I want to give you a little bit of Old Testament history that's going to lead us up to our very unique story. You have Abraham. You've heard of Father Abraham. Had many sons. Father Abraham. He marries Sarah, and they have a son named Isaac. Isaac's the one that God said, Abraham, take Isaac and kill him on, this, on the, uh, the, uh, the altar, and right before he plunges the knife into his son, the Lord says, no, no, don't do that. This is the Isaac we're talking about. Isaac marries a girl by the name of Rebekah, and Esau is now was the twin brother of Jacob. So Isaac and Rebekah have Esau and another twin called Jacob. The firstborn to Isaac and, and to Rebekah is Esau. Esau's the older brother. You got to catch that huge in the story. Esau's the older brother, and with the older brother, he is now the heir to take over as the patriarch. Abraham, and then Isaac, and now it's Esau. He's going to take over all of the family wealth. He will have a blessing. And this, with this blessing comes social superiority. It comes honor and privilege. With this, I'm the oldest son. I will take over. Now he will take over his father's lands, his money. The oldest son back in those days, whatever was passed down to him, he would be two, three times more wealthy than any other brothers that were going to be born. And this uh, Esau would have the older brother birthright. And with this comes the authority over family and all family finances and affairs. And this is crazy, but in that culture, nobody debates it. Oldest son gets the patriarch's stuff, becomes the most wealthy. When the patriarch dies, they become the person. They become him. They become the dude, right? This is the person who is the most wealthy in charge, and nobody debates it. If some little punky little younger brother comes around and starts debating, they are ostracized and many times are just killed. So nobody goes against what the family is saying. So we have Rebecca and Isaac. They, she is pregnant with twins. And now we're going to read the story. Genesis chapter 25, verse 24 and following. And when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. So they named him Esau. The word Esau in Hebrew means hairy or rough. Verse 26. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Again, Hebrew, heel grabber name or supplanter. He's reaching, trying to come out first, but he's not going to be first. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. As the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. <clears throat> he was an outdoorsman, but Jacob had a more quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So you have twins, and they're very much different. Esau, he's the hunter, he's the gatherer, he's the wild man, likes to be outside. Jacob likes to stay closer to home. When the Hebrew says here that, that uh, Jacob loved Esau more, the idea there is that he's more of the chip off the old block. Esau liked doing the things that his dad liked doing, so he, he hung out with him more. Jacob, apparently a little bit of a mama's boy, liked to stay closer to home. He enjoys doing home kinds of things, and he absolutely must be an incredible chef. He must be, when he's hanging around the house, he has learned how to cook up some good stew. Verse 29, one day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. So parenthetically, now we're reading through the story. We're like, Esau got another name called Edom because he gave up. We're going to see so much for this red stew, and so he becomes known as, when everybody hears the story, <laughs> old, old, old Red, 
Oh, red, right? Because he gave up, as we're going to see, so much. Esau said to Jacob, uh, one day when Jacob was cooking some, some stew, Esau uh, arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said, I'm starved. Give me some red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. Now, all right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? And you have to ask yourself in this story, is Esau really going to die of starvation, really? I mean, he's been out hunting. Maybe he's been out all day. Maybe even he slept in the woods and hasn't eaten for one night. But we can go many days without food. And so he comes in. He's starving. And he says to Jacob, man, Jacob, I know you made some of that incredible red stew. You've made some incredible stew before. I am so wanting some of your stew. Give me some of your stew. Jacob immediately sees the older brother and throws out a little bargaining chip. He's like, hey, at some point, I don't have to give you my delicious stew, but I'll tell you what, you seem to be really starving. He's probably not going to die, but he's starving. So if you give me your birthright on exchange, I will give you this stew. Now, you need to put yourself in the store. Here comes Esau. He is absolutely famished. He's not dying, but he's really hungry. Man, he can smell it. So now he has this craving. Maybe like an hour before he came in, he was like, man, when I get home, I'm going to have some of that stew. He was already thinking about it. He knew how good Jacob's stew was. So he was already thinking. He already was craving it. It was a huge desire. When he comes through the door, sure enough, there's the stew, and now He's dealt this deal. I will give you your craving, but you're going to have to give me your blessing. You're going to have to give me your birthright. Now, in psychological terms, you've got to pause the story. There's a psychological term called impact bias. Well, what is that? It's what we see happening in this story. Tendency to overestimate the positive or negative impact a perceived need will have. And so now I have this impact bias. I see that craving. I see that need. This is what I want. And so we overestimate how great it really will be. Many people, if I get this degree, if I can get this degree, my life will be set. So I'll do whatever. I'll do whatever to make sure I get that degree. Man, if I can just find Mr. or Mrs. Wright, if I could just get married, the rest of my life would be wonderful. Everything I've ever wanted, if I can just get married. And they begin to have this idea of impact bias. Impact bias. For some people, it's their job. If I can just get that job. Because all of a sudden, it begins to have this overestimation of how positive it is. Tell people all the time, if in your life the grass always looks greener on the other side, there's always something that looks greener on the other side, that grass may be, and most of the time, it's probably artificial turf because you're overestimating. You're always seeing something else impact bias. Another psychological term is focalism, which is magnifying the importance of one thing Watch this, until it overshadows the decision-making process because you're making decisions now driven by emotions. You're making decisions now driven by the, the craving inside. And so now you have focalism. You're focusing too much. It's, the importance of it has been magnified. This is what we see happening here. What use is my birthright? I'm about ready to die. Give me that stew that I've been dreaming about. Give me that stew that I know will have immediate mm, satisfaction. It will feel so good going down. And so now all of a sudden Esau has a decision 
to make. What would happen if in the middle of this story we could freeze frame, immediately have a freeze frame, stop, and then go to Esau and say, hey, before you make this huge craving decision, before you give up your birthright for a bowl of stew, let's just pause a second. Let's just see what happens in the future. What if we could do that if all of a sudden someone could throw a timeout to Esau and say, hey, listen, let's look forward. Let's look at like Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, as God is telling Moses what to do and reminding Moses who he is. It says, then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Esau, what happens there? What if all of a sudden it said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Esau? What would happen then? But that's not. Esau, listen, that's not what happens. We've paused. We've looked to the future. It's Jacob. He's the patriarch. Let's even go faster. Now, Esau, don't move. Esau, don't make a decision just yet. Let's go even further. Let's go into the New Testament. Let's go to the book of Matthew, where Matthew is given the genealogy of the connection to the Messiah. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham, the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah, pause just for a second, Esau. What if it said the father of Esau? What if it said the father, the Isaac, the father of Esau? Esau, the father of Judah. What if it said that? Esau, do you understand everything that's getting ready to happen? You're going to have that incredible bowl of stew. But everything will change. Nothing will stay the same. What if that could happen? Well, it didn't happen because that's how the verse reads. It reads, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah. We pull out of the story. Now the story goes back live, verse 33. But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath. And again, we think about the swearing an oath, not a big deal. Back then, a verbal blessing, a verbal oath was like a signed, sealed contract. He swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Verse 34, then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. Here you go. Here's your beef stew. And I'll throw in some cornbread. It's all for you, Esau. You can have everything here. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Esau shows contempt, meaning he didn't understand the importance or... In that moment, he couldn't delay the gratification. In that moment, he shows contempt. Again, meaning, I'm not sure if any of this is worth it. All I know is, man, give me that beef stew. Just give me that stew. And Jacob threw in some cornbread with it. Oh, who cares about the future? This is incredible. This craving. As it's going down my throat and going into my stomach is so now satisfied. He showed contempt for what was happening. And Jacob was like, there you go. And there Esau was. Man, he was just eating it. It tasted so good. He's wiping his mouth. It's just, it's the most incredible. I bet you he says something like this. This is the best stew I ever had. And Jacob's like, me too. Best stew I've ever made. We look at that story, and sometimes we just blow right through it. But when you think about, and I read to you the verses, how everything changes, you're like, 
Esau, that was stupid. Hence the title again, stupidity. Giving up God's best for an instant momentary craving. So let me ask you again. What would you trade for a bowl of stew? You're like, I wouldn't trade anything for a bowl of stew. Not so fast. Because now we have to redefine what is your bowl of stew. You see, all of us have things that make us crave this desire more than others. All of us have something in the example today, which is your stew. What is your craving inside? What is it that you think about other people? It's totally different, but this is the one. When tempted with this, when you're thinking about, and you're just daydreaming, this is what comes to your mind that you really desire, right? Tell people all the time, if you want to kind of understand what your real goals are in life, if you really want to understand what your stew is, your desires, your cravings are, when you're just kind of resting in a hammock, and it's been a good day, or you're just kind of laying on the couch, and again, it's been a good day, and your mind just begins to wander. What is it that you're dreaming of? What is it that are your goals? Because who would give up everything for a bowl of stew? You would. I would if it is our internal cravings. Again, internal cravings, if you break them down, their baseline are God-given, right? God-given desires that are created inside of us. We already talked about that. And many times, we can discover what ours is and not be taken back by it by looking at our personality. Personality drives a lot of this, things you really want, things that you crave that Maybe your sister or your friend or something, nobody else, but you crave it. It's part of your personality. But not only your personality, as you begin to understand your internal cravings that are God-designed, but sin is kind of distorting it just a little bit. Many times you can go and look at your upbringing. How were you raised? Many times, see it all the time, people who were raised really poor. I mean, they just didn't have a lot. I'm talking about really poor, and then they were able to work really hard, and they were able to get that job, and then they were able to get that money, and then all of a sudden, their cravings are to um, get more and more stuff because of the way they were raised. I will never let that happen to my, there will never be no food in my refrigerator, I've heard people tell me, or they, they, they start having kids, and they're like, listen, I'm going to make sure my kids don't struggle the way I struggle. They're not going to have what. So our upbringing, our personality plays a lot into what is it that I crave? What is it that I really have this internal desire? Our experiences also, different experiences we have. So as we go through the rest of this message, I want, to be, I want you to think about not just the bubbling stew behind me, but what is your Stew. What is your internal cravings? Momentary craving that if you start to slurp it could end up being a lifetime disaster or that you're craving it so much and you're trading in God's best. That girl or that special guy you're, you're talking to and getting really close to you probably shouldn't be talking to him, but you are. And now things are getting a little bit more heated up. Stew. What is the craving? It's intimacy, which is normal. Excitement. Sexual gratification, which is, again, normal. But in this case, with that person, it's a bowl of stew. That gray area business deal that no one really is going to know about. You just got to move some numbers. Stew. Do. What's the craving? It's financial stability. It's purchase power. It's acceptance because of what the money can get to me, because of what happened in the company. And so many people started to applaud me. Again, wanting this acceptance, this value, that's a normal how we get it, stew. That pornography, 
that you shouldn't be watching. That Netflix TV, you shouldn't be watching. Stew. You know, in today's world, with social media, with all everything right at your fingertips, so, it's even so much different. And sometimes, and we know this to be true, let's just get honest, right? Sometimes we're not even really out looking for problems, but because we have this internal craving as we're scrolling through Facebook, or we're scrolling through, through Instagram, and now we got all these reels, right? And, you can, and you've probably been there too. And you're just looking at, uh, you're in a reel, it's like, man, it's a great sermon. And it's over here where, where, where the church is advertising on it. And you're scrolling, and all of a sudden, for the boys in the room, all of a sudden, a very attractive person, very scantily dressed, live and in front of you, gives you a little wink and says, hey, I bet you'd like to spend more time if you go to the link in my bio, all of a sudden, stew. All of a sudden, stew. What's the craving? Excitement. Pleasure. Again, could be sexual gratification. All right there. But if we don't understand the craving, if we don't understand the ability to push back from the table, then all of a sudden it could lead to a lifetime of missing God's best. The instant gratification hobby, sport, or recreation that keeps you away from church, keeps you away from being involved, stew. That weed you're smoking, that alcohol you're abusing, stew. That new promotion or side hustle that will make you more money but you never see your family the way you should, or you can't be involved in spiritual things the way you should. Stew. All driven by our cravings. All, when we see somebody else's stew, we think, well, that's crazy. Just like we look at like Esau, really? Dude, that stew couldn't have been that good. But what did he do? He had impact bias. He had focalism. And in that moment, and I've been there, and you've been there, in that moment, the craving, that internal desire, you don't think about the future. You don't think about what you're trading in. You just want to feel valued. You just want to feel excited. You just want to have fun. You want someone to champion who you are. Stu. Now, some of you are like, wait a minute. Kenny, I, I thought we believe in the Bible that if you and I make wrong decisions, I mean, it is wrong, that God has grace and forgiveness. Isn't that true? Absolutely. I've been there. You've been there. We've gobbled down and slurped down the stew. We've wiped our face. You're like, oh, there's no way. Now that moment of gratification is done. You're like, oh, conviction comes on. So what do we do? We do exactly what we should do. We begin to pray. We say, God, I was slurping the stew knowing that it was wrong. I went with the craving. It was sin. So, God, I want to receive your forgiveness. And in that moment, because he's a God of love and grace, he does. He casts our sin away. He forgives us. And many of us have, have experienced that. And when we think about consequences, there really hasn't been, and that's just the mercy and grace of God. But we need to know that many times forgiveness can happen, but the consequences of the action that momentary satisfaction could have ripple effects for many, many days, months, or years. What would happen? Remember Esau? Freeze frame. Esau, before you eat the stew, let's look and see what happens and see if you want to make the same decision. You and I would say the same thing. There's no way Esau makes the decision if he looks ahead and goes, oh, wow, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No, no, no. I want to be rich. I want to be the patriarch. I want to set in motion. I want to be linked to the Messiah. Are you kidding me? If given that opportunity, freeze frame, stop. He'd be like, you know what? 
Jacob, you can have your stew and your cornbread. I'm going to make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm going to delay my gratification. Guess what? There's no freeze frame. No one stopped. But I want to encourage us to wise up and begin to do this. That as you, because you know, right? We know. What are our cravings? We know we're pushing up to the bowl, starting to kind of simmer and look good. I want us to begin to now do the discipline of just forecasting. What if we could? Right before, right before, freeze frame, let's fast forward a couple of years, maybe 5, 10, 15 years on Facebook, right? Everybody lives out their life on Facebook. And what if we could do that? And, and stop just a second. Let's fast forward through Facebook, and then you see a picture posted, and you're like, why is there somebody else giving my daughter away at her wedding? You keep fast forwarding, and you're like, how come there's somebody else with my family at my lake house? And we could all do some fast forwarding, right? What if we could actually see the ramifications of the decisions that we're making, this craving of our soul, of what we're doing. Sometimes absolutely wrong. Sometimes just the difference between wise and unwise. What would happen if you could go through and someone push stop? You finally found that special guy, that special girl. And all of a sudden, things are just getting a little bit more heated. And all of a sudden, there's some promises made. What if you could stop and fast forward it and scroll through your Instagram and see that person is not even a part of your life? What could happen? We really don't know for sure. But I do want to give you the discipline that you can do. You can stop and just look and see. Because sometimes just looking and seeing will help you curb the craving. So there are time that remains. I want to now look at this curbing of this craving. Esau didn't do it. He's just slurping it down. I want us to be able to push away from the table. We said that internal cravings are God-designed and sin distorts it. So how do, we, how do we help that? It is to see God for who he is. It is then to seek the Lord. And say, God, what is your best? And then understand, uh-oh, now understand where that craving is coming to. We already talked about personality. We already talked about uh, experiences and life, uh, uh, how we were raised. And so I want to encourage you to do something that for many of us could be very painful. But I know it will be helpful for all of us. Is to take some time today or tomorrow and begin to look at why do I have that craving? Why do I have that desire? Boil it down and go, oh, that's a natural, normal thing. How is it that sin is distorting it? Because I, I desire, which is normal, physical touch, and yet that's not the way to do it. Or I, I desire to be able to provide for my family, yet that's not the way. So you gotta, you got to understand, again, it's just a baseline normal deal. Don't feel bad about that. But then begin to walk it through. Why is it going to be unwise? How is it being distorted? We said that internal cravings never fully and finally satisfy, right? Never really happens. So we have to then begin to learn, as Paul says, in all things, I have learned, which means there's some effort, I have learned to be content. When I had a lot of stuff, content. When I was really, really poor and things, I'm getting beaten, I'm content. Why? Because our contentment should not come from what we have, what we do, what we experience. Our contentment comes as a Christian because of our relationship with Christ. So Paul says, I've learned Contentment. You and I need to make that a part of what we do every day, understanding contentment and understanding how desires, listen, how desires and cravings work. 
You are not going to click on that site. You are not going to purchase. You're not going to do that side hustle. You're not going to whatever it is you feel it. And then the next day go, hmm, I am forever fully satisfied in that. It's probably just going to grow more. And it's going to become more and more. So learn contentment. We said the internal cravings always whispers now, never later. And so we have to learn delayed gratification. I've been saying this forever, ever, ever, ever. I tell my boys, one of the greatest disciplines you can understand is delayed gratification. For high school kids, those before married, is the sexual thing, is that really fun? Can that be really exciting? Delay the gratification. Yeah, but everybody, and I want to ex- delay, it'll be so much better this normal desire when you have the gratification over there. If you're a parent, you've had this conversation. Oh, I don't want to study. I just want to get whatever grade. I want to go out and do this over here. I want to go out and play. Listen, if you'll delay the gratification and put a little more time into studying, then the grades you're going to get is going to then unlock some doors, and then later down the road, you will have more gratification than that Quick little shut the book and go out and play and have a good time for just quick little gratification. Delayed gratification. It's a huge spiritual discipline. And it helps for us to be able to push back from the bowl of stew and say, man, that would be really good. Now, sometimes, listen, it's not always between right and wrong. Those are kind of easy. Easy in the sense of knowing what you should do. Many times, it's just the difference between unwise and wise. Internal cravings, we said, always comes with a choice. And so sometimes the choice isn't right or wrong. It's unwise or wise. This week, I'm going to go, as I have since I was 18 years old, but here at Team Church for the last 12 years at Bon Clarkin. We'll go to camp, have an incredible time, and then graduating, rising seniors. They just graduated. I take them. We go to Waffle House. We have a good time. And then I take these seniors on a hike. And we go waterfall, we slide down. Some of them are so scared. They like, know you can try this, just don't tell your mom. You know, we slide down waterfalls, we're doing stuff, it's fun. But along the way, we give little insights and we talk about this idea of learning to discern. And I'll get them on a path somewhere, we're kind of walking, and I'll say, you know, a lot of times, this is the way God wants us to go, this is God's best. And we, we, we don't make a, a bad, we don't make a wrong choice, just a little bit unwise. And we don't make a a wrong choice in the sense of sinful, but just a a little unwise. And not really a sinful wrong one, but just just another little unwise. And then another little unwise. And then I show them, as I'm almost over here in the woods, the path, God's best is going that way. Along the last couple of weeks or months, first year in college or whatever it may be, I've had that conversation all the time. It's not a bunch of wrong, sinful choices. It was unwise, 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 unwise. And now I'm so far off of God's best. We have that conversation. So I say, listen, you are now 18, graduated high school. It's time to learn delayed gratification. It's time to learn contentment. It's time to learn to discern. You can't just have whatever you want just because it's yummy, yummy, yummy in my tummy. Learn to discern wisdom unwise, making right decisions. So as we think about our bowl of stew, would you give up God's best for a bowl of stew? The answer is you would if you are not prepared to make godly, wise choices. Again, thank God. I would say this, many of you would say it, that the consequences, the challenges that have rippled out, God's protected by his mercy and grace. But we don't want to put that up. We don't want to move hoping, right? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. No one moving around. During this whole message, we've had a steaming, sizzling, yummy bowl of 
stew behind me. I don't think anybody here would give up their birthright, wealth, privilege, honor, integrity for a bowl of stew. That's not the point. The point is what is your bowl of stew? What is your bowl of stew? I want you to prayerfully think through that even right now. Because my guess, just like first service, some of us right now, we're slurping it down. And at this point, it hasn't become horrendous. You need to stop. If you need to get help, get help. But you know it's got to stop. Some of us aren't slurping the stew right now. But man, we, are, we can smell it. The butter on the cornbread is glistening. The stew is amazing. And we, like Esau, are deciding if we're going to trade God's best. You need to name it. We need to see it. Fast forward. Where does this play out? Where does this play out? Do you have that in your mind? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, I want you to have the ability right now. Just confess it. Just confess it. Maybe some of us need to pray and ask the Lord to fast forward through our Facebook, fast forward through our Instagram stories. What does life look like? Where is she? Where is he? What am I 5, 10, 15 years from now based on the decision I'm about ready to make? The Lord will give you that type of wisdom. And as you're finishing up your prayer and your thought, remember, there are things that are right and wrong. Those are, in a sense of understanding what we should do, easy. Not always easy to push away from the table. But just like that conversation I have with our seniors, decide to choose wisdom. A bunch of unwise choices lead you off God's best. 